video recording of the videotaped interview of Gloria Duffy Sr. and Gloria Duffy Jr. Of, um, regarding the history of the Lafayette Library. Uh, the videotaping is being done by Paul Fillinger and we are in his home in Lafayette. talk about early importance of library and maybe the first time, Gloria, you took your daughter to the library and why libraries were important to you and you'd want to do that for her. The history. Do you want me to start right now? Yeah. Can you see the little red lights? All right. <laughs> um, Gloria, when you were little and you moved over here, we were in San Francisco, but we moved to Lafayette. And at that time, there was a little library downtown. I think it was in a little cottage, a little house. It wasn't like a real library, but it was. You know, they were operating a small bungalow near where the library had been in Lafayette. And I remember clearly taking you there to this little bungalow, and we would reach in and you know, look at books and uh, uh, you pick out some that look interesting to you, probably by cover, because you were quite young. I don't remember the exact age, but quite, um, I don't think you, you hadn't started school. So under five. Under five. five. <laughs> and um, we went to the little library. It was about the first place we greeted when we came to this town to live. And, and why why did that occur to you as an activity to do with your well first <laughs> child? I grew up in Denver, Colorado. We lived on what was known as Capitol Hill. And right down at the bottom of Capitol Hill was the Denver Public Library. I actually grew up as being affiliated to the library. It was the place I went. Mother was in those days afraid to have me walking five blocks or so down to the library. And I had great collections of books that you could take home as many as you wanted to. And I had to learn the severe lesson of not keeping them out too long <laughs> because my mother refused to pay any fees because I needed to know to bring them back at the date they were supposed to be brought back. And um, I therefore I learned a lot more about books because I had to work out my fees there uh, because I would not bring them back too promptly. I see. So uh, she taught me the lesson by letting me find out what happened if I didn't do it right. And they, I did a lot of cleaning up of books, and uh, I had a little doggy, and I tied her outside of the room at the library, which happened to be down on the um, main floor. And uh, we, we worked on cleaning the books. <laughs> Was that in payment of fine? Yes, I see. So I earned my fine, because my mother said I couldn't just keep the books as long as I felt like it. An important lesson. Yes. And I remember, I didn't remember that it was a cottage or a bungalow, but I do remember going with you when I was very young, checking out books and going home with big stacks of books, and then I'd put them beside my bed, and I would read them, I'd read through them very quickly, uh, and I think your mother had me reading, you know, very early before going to kindergarten, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, even serious books, and uh, so I would just work my way through this big stack of books every week, reading in the morning before I got up, at night before I went to sleep, and uh, then I continued, and when the new library came, we continued this routine of going to the library once a week, and I think I mostly returned the books on time. <laughs> you were better than I was. Did you, do you remember the Shakespeare, uh, how my mother, I not only I did, went to the library and 
Scott, she speaks by Shakespeare and told you the different stories with um, you. that with you, and then started taking you to performances I know. at various locations. I know. For instance, I remember that at first I had, I think, a children's version of Shakespeare plays. Mm -hmm. And I read my way through that, and then I think when I was about 13, she got me the collected works of Shakespeare, and I worked my way through that. And uh, yeah, she took me to Ashland every summer, uh, starting when I was about 12, uh, to see several plays. And that comes right up to the present time. I just got back from England, where my husband and I went to Stratford-on-Avon and saw A Winter's Tale by the Royal Shakespeare Company. So whenever I can, I still indulge that interest in Shakespeare that started way back at the library, uh, probably yeah. again before I was five, six years old. Well, I think now with this wonderful new library coming to Alpheus, that the families will be able to take their little young ones and start them out on a, a journey, as I've had through my life, with books. Well, and that's a wonderful thing, that it can be passed from generation to generation. It can, and I think it's important to our living and our learning. Uh, I don't know what I would have done without the libraries. I was an only child. And so my mother didn't want me running around the streets. And, and she she loved books and loved reading. So it passed to me. And we had a wonderful library in Denver at that time. And the people had built it for the youth. And uh, I was one of the best users. And I know my mother loved it too. And I think the fact not only, you know, in the early days, you, this was during the Depression, I mean, you were right, born in the 20s, and uh, money was not in great supply, and when I was young, in the early stages, we weren't wealthy, and there was no Amazon.com, and there were no big bookstores, right. <laughs> so for both financial reasons, but also just the way the economy worked at that time, the library was the place that you went if you wanted books and you wanted to read. I think parents, too, had a sort of confidence in, in, when the children were at the library. They were behaving themselves at the library. It could be kind of tough if you didn't do things right. And uh, I think my mother always felt I was safe and being looked after also, mm -hmm. which was pretty much true in those days. Mm -hmm. You know, I would love to know more about the story of how you handled it, how old you were when you got some fines, and you had to go to that librarian. How well did you know her? What would you? What do you remember about that first sort of? You know, did, did your mom make you go alone to talk? You know, tell us a little bit about what you remember that got you to the point where she handed you books to clean, and how you might have cleaned those books. Well, the person that handed me the books to clean was the operator of the library division there in Denver. That. I was using, and mother was pretty much out of it because she was a busy working mother, mm -hmm. and uh, I could walk back and forth to the library. It was conveniently located near where we lived mm -hmm. on Capitol Hill in Denver. So did your mother tell you, you have these fines and it's up to you how to handle these? Yes. Yeah. And so you had to go to the librarian and oh, say, yes, there is a lot I, of I have, about it. I don't have any money for these fines, so yes. what uh -huh. can I do? So yes. That's exactly the picture of like washing the dishes at the restaurant if you don't can't pay the bill. You know, and now it's coming back too, it's kind of interesting. By having that little young experience of not messing up the books, you know, and having to take care of them, I later uh, when I was maybe 14 or so, began to work at a bookstore mm -hmm. in Denver, and it was a very famous bookstore. The gentleman who ran it became a world-known book collector of Western history. That was his uh, special niche, and it was wonderful. It added a very special thing in my life and gave me a special kind of a background and knowledge that I would never have had if it hadn't been for all that uh, experience. And you know, it's interesting, you learn things about your mother even in an er interview like this. Mm -hmm. um, for the last five years or so, I've co-owned a bookstore uh, in, a, in a different area. And when we opened the bookstore, my mother came to me with a 
bag full of gum erasers and said, uh, because we sold mm -hmm. some old books, mm -hmm. used books as well as new books, and said, you might need these. <laughs> <laughs> Clean up, you know, some of the old books. And now I know where that. Defined. Now I know where that uh, came from. Came from. It came from your taught. experience cleaning up the uh, yes, right. the books. You're correct. Exactly. <laughs> I learned about the use of a soft rubber eraser. I see. Try and find one. They're not really sold except in certain places and circumstances. Mm -hmm. So I have a little bit of interesting background. <laughs> With books, <laughs> always, always. So when you look at um, when you look at the way that um, that we've grown to a library, and I think I'm going to jump here and go straight to the non commonwealth stuff. We'll come back to that. But look at the way that, um, that that you say your mother was a working mom, and we'd love to know a little bit more about you know what that really meant. You know, it's very unusual at the time. So so what would that be? What kind of you know how much that would have meant for freedom for you? And whether or not, what kind of relationships you might have made even with the librarian as someone who saw you frequently because as a place you were allowed to go, and what kind of community you might have created as a young child in Denver, and how that might have informed your the way you talked about libraries to your own children. I think I need to tell you about how I became so involved with the libraries. I seem to want to learn about faraway places. And the library there in Denver, where I grew up, had a program for the children. It was a travel program. And you could travel by books. So I traveled all over lots of places in the world, which taught me about them and made me want to really do it someday. And as you know, <laughs> I have gone around quite a bit and seen a good bit of the world. Mm -hmm. I think it gave me special interest that a lot of ladies in those years didn't have because they were they were not exposed mm -hmm. maybe to a we really had a lovely library in Denver. I thought it was great and it's probably still great. Mm -hmm. And uh, I lived close to it. It was a second home and you were uh, mentioning about your mother being a working mother, which this was, again, we're talking about the 1930s there, mm -hmm. 1940s, and that was fairly unusual at the time. It was. And mother, we, another thing that was very important is we did not have a car. And uh, my mother had to walk to work, and I had to walk to the library, I had to walk to school, uh, she accompanied me and then went on to her work when I was quite young. And then as I grew a little older, we lived on the Capitol Hill area and it was, I knew my way around. And we finally moved from a large home after my father died to a small place. And I could, I, it wasn't the same as today. Uh, she didn't seem to need to worry about me all the time, and she knew if I wasn't home, and I wasn't in school, and I had long hours because I was also a musician, and we had practiced before and after school, mm -hmm. so the school took care of me until, say, 7 o'clock in the evening, and early morning, she would take me on her way down, so um, there were people that were trustworthy, and uh, it all worked out wonderfully well. And Mother kept food in the uh, kitchen and uh, had us a nice, decent place to live to her hard work. And uh, she loved to read, too. So if she had a little time, you could, could usually see her with a book. Mm -hmm. And she even wrote a book. It's never been published, but I do have it. You can get that taken care of. That's one of the things I didn't get done. Okay. So tell us a little bit, when you transitioned to radio, how much um, of your of your abilities to really handle yourself in a radio and a lot of different topics were informed by some of that early reading? Did it, did it have any connection at all to all this? I mean, I just, it was such an unusual thing to do, and, and maybe you can tell us a teeny bit about that, and, and also how 
this independence and, and early reading and ability to work with, obviously you were able to interact with adults and you're talking about librarians at that young age. How did that relate at all, if, if it did? I think you remember that I started to work quite, you know, after I'd been to college, so. I started to work for CBS Network, which was called KLB. They call letters in Denver, Colorado. I was pretty young, but I had had some training in radio use in my college, Stevens College in Columbia, Missouri. So I uh, I needed a job when I graduated, and he earnestly needed for me to work. And I went down and took a what do you call it? Uh, audition. Mm -hmm. And they hired me. They gave me a real job. And they, I had to write, and I got a little salary for writing the program. And I also received a salary for um, giving the program. But I had several every day. From early morning, I had to get up about 4.30 and walk through the snow or whatever the conditions were down to the radio station and um, I got lots of practice and used to start I think I'd be down there about 6 30. I think the first program I did each day was 7 30. And would you read background material if you were if interviewing yeah. or doing a program oh, yes. on a particular topic? Yes you had to so, so I could go to the library and get a background. One of the toughest one I ever had was to write about the ba Battle of the Bulge. Mm -hmm. And of course, there was another young lady working there too. We were both about the same age. And we had the slightest idea of where the bulge was <laughs> or, or what it was. Uh, it was coming in on the news uh, ticker mm -hmm. that we would have in our newsroom there. And it gave me a a different background than I ever would ever have mm -hmm. had if I hadn't had that type of work to use the, the questioning mm -hmm. and everything that I learned over the years mm -hmm. by reading and by my mother's. She was a woman who loved to know what was going on mm -hmm. and what was influencing this or that. And, you know, there were times in that we we had to pull the blinds down because they didn't want any light showing for fear that we would be uh, bombed, mm -hmm. et cetera. This is World War II yeah. era. So it, uh, the history is unfolding mm -hmm. to be written in a book somewhere, sometime for me to read or my mother mm -hmm. or children today, mm -hmm. you know, as they learn to read. You know, as you're talking, it occurs to me that you may not know some things about my relationship to life. I mean, not one of my first jobs was in a library. Did you know that? Where was that? So I was a student at Occidental College in LA as an undergraduate, and I think it was about my sophomore year or so. And I was interested in international affairs, and I needed a job to get a little income coming in, and so I was hired to work in the library at Occidental. And uh, it was uh, in a facility called the Area Studies Research Center. And as you know, I went on to a career in international affairs, uh, where and today things are done in a very different way. But at that time, research about different regions of the world was largely done by reading the media from that part of the world in the various different languages. Uh, from the Soviet Union at that time, it was based on U.S. government agencies listening in to the radio and television and reporting out what was being said and translating it. And in other countries, in Germany and, and Italy and France and so on, uh, the college received the newspapers from those areas. And then my job was to clip articles related to certain topics that students and faculty would be doing research on, and then to file them in a way that could be found if people were doing research on then the common market or on uh, the arms reduction talks in Central Europe or on the, the uh, oil and gas economy of Russia, um, I clipped and organized what one would And I had, you know, 
French language, Spanish language, and I was also studying Russian language. So I could cover, you know, most of the art articles and newspapers from different areas of the world. Then as I went on and I went to graduate school and got a PhD and did my research, and of course I've written a couple of books, published a couple of books, um, I worked in many of the major libraries, you know, of the world, including uh, I did research one summer in the National Archives and the Library of Congress. I think uh, I remember that. And I, of course, um, you know, used the library at Columbia where I went to graduate school. And then when I came for a postdoc fellowship at Stanford, I was a frequenter of both the Hoover Library, uh, which has a tremendous collection on the former Soviet Union, my area of expertise, and then the regular libraries at Stanford. I've used the UCLA Library and the Berkeley Library and the Widener Library at Harvard. So as I went on and wrote a textbook in my field and wrote some other books and chapters in many books in my own field, I went on and used libraries for research. And you could see how much it meant yeah, to your so career. Absolutely. They were fundamental. Now today, uh, for a researcher um, and a scholar, there are many sources of information, obviously, through the internet and so on. But during those years, the I spent a lot of time. I had my own, at, at Occidental, I had my own Carol in the Occidental Library because I was what was called a college scholar, which was sort of a special status. So I had my own little place in the library. I had the same thing at Hoover Library when I was at Stanford, you know, where I kept my books and research materials and so on. And so I actually, I've spent quite a lot of time at libraries over the years. When you put it that way, I realized. Yes, I that that really didn't I remember think about visiting you down in Eagle Rock, mm -hmm. and uh, I think you took me to an office that you were working at. Mm -hmm. But I guess I didn't focus in on mm -hmm. that as to such a big part in your academic life. Right. And now at Occidental, I'm on the board. I chair the Academic Affairs Committee, and the operations of the library there come under the area that my committee on the board oversees. Yes. So things. Come around. Thank you. I mean, I'm thinking about your story about the clipping of the articles and how young people are in um, in the college environment and when they're exposed to a particular library uh, kind of field. I'm wondering, it's hard to imagine something not happening and then would your journey go, but I'm imagining quite a lot of information dumping into your brain as you're reading those various articles you would not otherwise have read and wondering, you know, it, about that opportunity as compared to young kids today on the internet and you know but more mainly more about it, your journey yourself would you have chosen Russia were you learning things there that tilted you and were you showing some initial interest just based on the articles you were reading and what captured you and didn't well and I was taking courses mm -hmm. on Russia and the former Soviet Union and other parts of the world and issues and so on so I was studying that field but uh, one thing that early exposure to reading the media from many different countries certainly did give me a sense of there being many different perspectives on current issues. And, and the fact that the American media didn't always report what was going on in other parts of the world, which uh, has changed somewhat with the advent of CNN and so on. But um, at that time, there was not great reporting in detail of the issues in other countries. So it certainly made me more aware of the need for us to uh, gather more information about what was going on in different parts of the world in order to for the U.S. to make its way and deal successfully in the world. So, so yes, I mean, it, it gave me an awareness and I'm sure helped me. It, it taught me how to do research also, which also I was learning in classes. But, you know, I went on and became a researcher and a scholar and, um, you know, uh, an expert in my field. So it certainly was the, the first time I learned how to do serious research. Those skills then, I knew them already when I got to graduate school and when I taught at Stanford and when I was writing and, you know, uh, working in my field. So uh, I learned those, you know, through doing that research and through doing that that work that I did in the library. Well, what's happened, I think, in the library field, as you see, the public library was the nice cottage, the place, the home away from home, and you might get a chance to do some research if they happen to have the periodicals. 
the academic libraries where you went for the big thing, and often in a large institution, private, little, smaller libraries within the library world might really house what you needed. But now, and then you have the corporate libraries. Now, when you look at libraries and the access to um, just even the databases that can go, how much people have opened up, and the average citizen can do quite a bit of research, maybe not primary, but certainly a lot of peer-reviewed research. How is that changing how you're feeling about the, you know, which libraries do you use now? I mean, when you look at a library, are you using Lafayette Library, either of you currently? Do you go to check out books there? Or a lot of people have tilted to Amazon, and it's, you know, it just, I just wonder, currently, where do you use the library now in your life? I have to say that I'm not using it as much. Mm -hmm. My reading time is extremely limited now. And of course, my eyes aren't as good as they once were. So I can't say personally that I am using the library as much. I still work, <laughs> have taken care of business. Mm -hmm. uh, if I needed to look up some facts or something, I don't write where to go. But just fortunately, I haven't had too much of that to do in later years. But I know many seniors that reading is a source of life to them. They, they uh, depend on their ability to have the services of a good library, and it's an addition to their life and a social uh, experience for them. I, I've listened to some women talk about that, and they always say, I never need to be really lonely because I have books. And I think that's a wonderful way to live, that you do have that opportunity to read about other places. And it influenced my life that I didn't want to always uh, stay home. I wanted to go out and see what the world was really all like, and I packed up my kids and we went, didn't we? Mm -hmm. That's true. And similarly, my life is very busy, and so I don't spend a lot of time in libraries. However, I similarly notice how important they are to people that I see. So for instance, um, I'm a commuter and I, I live in Silicon Valley and I work in San Francisco and I ride the train a good part of the time. And every day I see people up and down the peninsula with their books and I can see where it says, you know, Burlingame Library or uh, San Jose Public Library. And so I know for, you know, people who have that routine of commuting, the public libraries are extremely to them. So my interest, and I have to say I do do quite a lot of research and so on, uh, but I use the internet and I use other methods. I have people who work for me who assemble material and present it to me and so on. But I feel that it's important to um, help libraries move into the next generation so that they are available not only to seniors, commuters, kids, and so on, but so that they are places where people who are looking for information through the internet, through meetings and gatherings, and that of course relates to the new the concept of the new Lafayette Library, um, you know, have a place to do that. And so I think my involvement has been really for the, the public and the public service and public interest of libraries, where my, my life may not be such right now that I draw on them a lot, um, I do know that many people do, and it's important that we create them in a way that are, is accessible to people today. Well, it sounds very much that libraries were both, for both of you, a gateway into a, a really nice uh, life journey and work journey. But that may bring us into the Commonwealth, sure. but that's where we're, we're, we're headed. But I, um, I can tell you how much libraries have meant to me in my life. Well, don't do it without the tape. <laughs> Everywhere I've lived or gone, and well, yeah, that was all right, we'll talk about that. And frankly, this is making me think also, mm -hmm. especially you know when I was younger, how much I spent a lot of time in libraries. And well, I think it's evolutionary too. I think you come and go. To, or, oh, it's so nice of you. Thank you. Are you sure you wouldn't like this? Mm -hmm. Are you sure? Um, I have some wine. Would that be a little bit? <laughs> 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 Cocktail. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Just need that. Yeah, I don't put this on a piece of paper, so. Of 
for no one will yell at you. Oh, oh, I need it. It has not just books, but it's got rooms where people meet, and the Commonwealth has got the programs there. And it's kind of a library plus. Uh -huh. So I'm sure we'll get that. You're, you're just about to get that. It's and I forgot you have the community. Oh, oh. <laughs> you know, okay. yeah. Hold that. <laughs> Coming back to it. Um, oh, such good sound bites off tape. Um, okay. We're all ready. I'm okay. ready when you're ready. Okay, so what I was going to say is that I can see that libraries have really been the gateway to quite an interesting life journey, and a lot of people do go in and out of using them for books. Nowadays, there are so many other things that a library is for, and that is really very much the story of the Lafayette Library and Learning Center. Uh, and we've had many people say they don't check out books, but they go to Sweet Thursdays, or they see the pro you know there are programs that they participate with at the library in its old location. So maybe you could talk a little bit about um, the way libraries are changing and the importance of of the library as you were beginning to say, Gloria, about they've been everything. Uh, I think it's you. Yes. We'll start with him. What have they meant to you? And, uh, how I think you know uh, how much they've meant to me, libraries, wherever I can. I can't say that I've had any deep affiliation with this new library that's being built. I look forward to it very much. But it's not there yet, <laughs> and I haven't had occasion to... Uh, had the same needs I had 30 years ago or 40 years ago when my children were in school. So think of what that means to the people that are living here and raising families. It's going to be the same good that I had, only better <laughs> and more of it. Sure. That little one we started out with was like, I don't remember it being more than one room. I don't, if it had other rooms, I guess I didn't know about it. And that's not the library you see today, and that's way back for the back of that. So uh, you've attended though some Commonwealth Club programs yes, so. in Lafayette, yes. which we plan to hold in the library. So that will bring you to the new library. Yes. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, I made a small donation to the library project and you matched my donation, so in fact you have contributed to this new library. I have. Right. With you. <laughs> We've been looking forward to it coming on. That's true. So, um, Gloria, maybe you could talk a little bit about the Commonwealth Club's role in the new library, the Glenn Seaborg Consortium, and, uh, you know, what that meant to you as someone who connected back into Lafayette and how your organization um, is already pulling in here more than it had before we, the consortium was really even discussed. Sure. So uh, when I was in high school in Lafayette, with my mother's encouragement, I became involved in some local issues. And one of the issues was the fact that there weren't a lot of things in Lafayette for young people to do. Uh, there was not a lot going on culturally. There was not a lot going on in terms of uh, discussion of issues. We did some of that in high school. We had some speakers come in and so on on various issues, the Vietnam War or whatever was going on in the society. But beyond that, Lafayette was more or less of a bedroom community with people commuting to San Francisco or elsewhere to work. And I began to work uh, to set up a youth commission in Lafayette uh, to uh, take on the question of uh, how to create a better uh, environment and more activities for young people in Lafayette. In the process of doing that, I met the then mayor of Lafayette, Bob Fisher. Uh, and I then, uh, I worked on, we created the Youth Commission. Um, I stayed in touch with Bob over the years. Uh, when he, I worked on, even after I left for college, I worked on his campaign for re-election as mayor. Uh, I reconnected with him when he became president of uh, the uh, San Francisco Foundation. And through his various um, uh, iterations when he was president of John F. Kennedy University, uh, I stayed in touch with him and we worked on some other uh, issues together. It was Bob who first called me up and told me about the new Lafayette Library Project and the Glenn Seaborg Learning Consortium. Uh, this is probably, I can't even recall now, five, six, 
seven, eight years ago. And uh, I hadn't really, other than being connected to my family, I hadn't really been connected to any other activities in Lafayette. Um, I came and I spoke occasionally at an event in Lafayette, but I wasn't involved in any activities in the community. And remember that by this time, oh, probably 35 years had elapsed. So um, Bob told me about the concept for the Lafayette Library, and, and this is in my hat as the head of the Commonwealth Club. And he said, we're going to build a library, and it's not just going to be a library, but it's going to be a place for learning, and we'd like to be on books and community discussion. And we'd like to the Commonwealth Club to be, and I think we were probably the first organization to commit ourselves to be part of something called the Glen Seaboard Learning Consortium, where a dozen organizations from the East Bay, or who were active in the East Bay, like the Commonwealth Club has been to some degree, would be part of an ongoing uh, group that would present lectures and uh, have public forums and town hall meetings at the library as a way of learning through discussion and uh, human interaction as opposed to just books. And uh, again, going back to those early days in Lafayette, and I should also say I started a class at Akalani's High School when Bob was mayor, back when I was in high school, for him to come in once a week and teach and talk about local issues. And uh, so going back to you know that relationship, anything he was interested in doing, hey, I was up for that challenge. So I got involved, uh, I committed the Commonwealth Club to be uh, one of the partners in the Glen Seaboard Learning Consortium. And I also uh, helped a bit in the early fundraising for the library. I went up to Sacramento with a group from uh, Lafayette to appear at a bond issue, uh, at, at a hearing uh, for distribution of funds from the library, statewide library bond issue a few years ago. And I went to some meetings with some foundations where both Bob and I had connections to uh, some foundations in this region. So uh, there are different levels of my involvement and commitment in the project. Uh, but on behalf of the Commonwealth Club, we decided once we committed to being part of the Glen Seaboard Learning Consortium, which is attached to the Lafayette Library, and which is really pathbreaking. There's no other library in the country which had set out from the beginning, before the building of the new library, to have a group of organizations committed to being part of the teaching and learning process that would go on in the library. And I felt uh, we were looking at a five-year period or so between the initiation of the project, the commitment of the bond funds, the private fundraising, and the actual building and opening of the library. And I thought, that's really too long to wait for the Commonwealth Club. So we immediately decided to start holding programs in Lafayette, which we've been doing at the Lafayette uh, Veterans Hall, at the Bentley School, and elsewhere, and just get the ball rolling so that when the library did open, uh, the Commonwealth Club would already have an enthusiastic group of uh, local uh, people involved and, and uh, who, who were accustomed to coming to Commonwealth Club programs, and then we could just move it over to the library. So my, my uh, approach was, motto that Nike has, which is just do it. And so once we committed to doing it, my feeling was, let's do it. So for about three years now, the Commonwealth Club has had an active program of speakers, lectures, public forums. That has included um, some very prominent individuals. I recently did a, a discussion with Jim Lehrer uh, of the News Hour with Jim Lehrer, and we've had I did one with Ellen Tauscher, our departing congresswoman, who was on her way to become Under Secretary of State. Um, and we've held uh, community forums on issues like uh, water and water scarcity and availability and so on. So uh, almost once a week now in Lafayette, I'd say about two, three times a month at least, the Commonwealth Club hosts a program, which will then seamlessly move over to the library once the library is open. So I go back to having addressed that need that when I was about 16 in high school, I saw to create more um, community, intellectual, and learning activity in Lafayette. So it comes full circle. It took only about, let's see, 40 years, right? 
So when you look at um, when you look at how it draws a lot of people, and I have been to some of the programs, they're very good, and I know they draw beyond La Mirinda, which is not not um, against actually the overriding uh, position of the Lafayette Library and Learning Center. It was always designed as a local library and a regional learning center. So it's meant to draw more than just out of Lafayette. This is right on target. But when you are there at those events, how aware do you believe that the community that's attending those events are that this really is beginning to connect back to the Lafayette Library and Learning Center? Or is that something that we'll need to wait until you're actually in the, um, the facility itself? Well, they should be very aware because every time we hold an event, we say in the introductory material for the event, whoever is at the podium says, this is a part of the Lafayette, the Glen Seaboard Learning Consortium, it's a series that is connected to the Lafayette Library. So, so in, if, there, if people are listening, hopefully they will have heard. Uh, and we have done this in complete coordination with the Library and Learning Center organizing team and the group at the Lafayette Community Foundation and so on. So we've tried to iterate that each time we hold a program in Lafayette. So having been part of that early process where there wasn't much to do for kids and probably actually maybe even intellectually for adults here until we had more things to do and certainly now we're losing movie theaters and all sorts of things, to what degree uh, do you feel when we get back to the development of community here in Lafayette and as it relates to when you, for, you were both first moved in in 1954 and now it moves now, what can we expect this, this new idea, this new library and learning center to do with regard to building community? I mean, what are you hoping it will achieve? What, you know, what, what is different about this in the, in the building of community concept than it would have been in the old library, than it can be even today in the existing library? What do you see as the role this new library and all of the lectures and discussions will contribute to the community? I can't say that I don't think that it will harm the students that are here. They're going to come out with a, a wider, shall we say, appreciation of knowledge <laughs> and, and a place to go and seek it. I think it's wonderful, and I'm sure that the, any sensical um, citizens would feel the same way, and just get them started, very like myself. I was quite young when I began having affiliation with my library, which went on to a sub-career that I followed many times in my life, and uh, a lot of uh, interesting people and interesting subjects that I've had a part of because of my library love and affiliation. I think other people will have that too. I think we're in a time when there's a, a lot of information available, but making sense of it is difficult for people. They're bombarded by pieces of information. And this is one reason communities need to get together and talk. Um, certainly learn about what's going on in the outside world, but also talk about what's going on in the community and how what's happening in the community relates to the larger context of the economy or even foreign policy or uh, you know, the environment, whatever. So I see the learning consortium especially taking place in the library as very important for the community in Lafayette. If, uh, when communities are faced with crises, they need to have a history of being able to talk. People need to be, have, be able to talk to one another. You see that in race relations. You see that when there's a disaster like 9-11 or a natural disaster. Communities need mechanisms to um, solve their problems and to being able to talk to one another, you know, coming together somewhere in a community where issues are discussed is an important capacity to have in a community. That has, it used to happen a lot. People got together at the church, the, at the ice cream social, at the, you know, whatever, at the town hall for political 
meetings or rallies or whatever. There's little of that at this point in people's busy lives, connectedness to the internet. I mean, they're busy Twittering instead of sitting down and talking to each other. And so many people don't even really know what community they live in or, you know, they're, they're, they're out of context. And um, I think any town, or any community can really benefit by a place where people come together, hear ideas, um, think about those, they may not agree with them, interact with leaders, whether they're thought leaders, political leaders, business leaders. And so that's what the learning consortium, which is based in the library, will be about and will do for Lafayette. It's about building community and a network in the community where people are used to talking to each other. Sort of the antidote to social media. The ability, you know, a lot of people are making communities online, they're blogging, they're creating whatever in a virtual way. What you're really addressing is the ability to come to a place and physically go face to face with people, see people you might later run across at the same safe way, or you, you know, have a continued to conversation, but really putting real people back in the conversation. Is that really where you're going? Gloria, a companion to the videotaping and done in conjunction with it. This is Robin Fox speaking. And communities, you know, Lafayette is not a particularly threatened community, uh, but communities do face threats. It may be when a big company comes in and, you know, may muscle its way into trying to build something or do something in the community that may not be in the interest of the community. It may happen when there's a drought and there's an issue about the use of water or other resources. And um, communities need those patterns of association mm -hmm. within the community. And um, that's what the library, I hope, will become a center where there will be lots of activities and lots of meetings and discussions and so on. And that, you know, then in a normal way, but also if stress points occur in the community, um, there will be a habit of mm -hmm. community coming together and talking. That's almost metaphorically. There is. Um, if you take in the hard hat tour, no. Okay, if you take the hard hat tour, you'll find that the the local thing that will be like the generator for Lafayette, should there be a, a really critical crisis, happens to sit below the meeting room. It's, it's almost a metaphoric part. Uh, but but anyway, I, I think your point is well taken. And when you look at that, think about that as I now ask you um, when you take your one-and-a-half-year-old grandchild or your one-and-a-half-year-old great-grandchild, when the doors are open and you take them through, how will you describe this library to them and, and what it means to you and what maybe you feel she should learn it could mean for her? I think you should do that. I think for children, everything starts with reading. That's the main method of beginning to learn. Mm -hmm. And it starts, and my great-grandchild, whose name is Alexandra Sophia, mm -hmm. uh, Allie, um, is a big fan of books. Mm -hmm. So when we're over at her parents' house, they have a bookcase in the living room. And I always notice that all the books are pulled out of the bookcase. I mean, they're, they're children's books. She's 18 months old. But she has her little books, and her parents are reading with her. And she, her, one of her favorite things to do is go pull all the books out of the book, bookcase. And she sits down with them. She's all scattered around her, and you know she goes through her little books. That's where it all starts. The desire for information, the love of learning, uh, the ability to interact with parents or others around ideas and knowledge and, and so on. So I would just take her and say, you know, you already love to read. I don't, you know, I wouldn't take her probably for another couple of years. But um, this is the next step for you. This is where you find all of the books you could ever want. Mm -hmm. And you can progress from your children's books to young adult books to adult books. And then maybe, you know, both, both of her parents have graduate degrees. And they've been, you know, in fact, her father is a, uh, specialist, he works for NASA, and he's a specialist on instructional technology. He trains astronauts to do the biological experiments that they do in space. And so his field actually is 
called instructional technology. So they have a love of learning, and I know that they're going to teach that to her, but I would take her to the library and, sh and show her this is where it all starts, and, and you can go to many levels now, including eventually on to be a part of community discussion uh, about issues and, and topics in the community. I would add to that, that that's certainly a good way to start life and learning now. And that can be an association to help uh, the school uh, in the educational process. I think that has an added value. Well, you're right in that there's, and there we could get off into a discussion about the schools and funding and so on. Um, the schools obviously are the main vehicle for education, but there's a need for supplementary mm -hmm. resources. Uh, and I think even more today when funding for public schools is in short supply, uh, that supplemental resource is very important so that you know, the, the public school libraries may not be as well supplied mm -hmm. as they have been in the past. And uh, the hours may be shortened of school time and so on. So the library becomes even more important for kids so that they have a full range of books and other uh, learning tools available to them to supplement what they get in school. Do you know if they're going to have the library open at night? The, the intent is to do a quite a number of hours. It is funding based, but they're out there raising even more funding to do it. So I think. Could, could I interject a question sure. on this? Uh, uh, reading in Wired magazine and uh, other technical journals, there's so much said about how uh, information is going to be transmitted in the future. And you admit, just in your short life, you, you were glued to a library. Now people are getting it on the internet. They had to travel to interview. Now you can do uh, Skype or something. Uh, but it, the, the whole information world is changing so rapidly. Some, I've heard some people criticize, build a library. You know, that's, that's the old uh, model. The new model is who knows. I mean, things are changing. How what do you have to say about, I mean, the consortium is obviously very unique, and the community aspect is very uh, crucial. What about the people that say, hey, you know, we're all going to be wired, artificial intelligence will be here, we'll have uh, the history of man in, in, in uh, our hand, but how does that affect a new expensive library? Well, this debate, of course, has raged around the San Francisco Public Library and others. Why do you need a library today? You can get all the information you need on the in Internet, and I have to tell you, I have not done it yet, but I am on the verge of getting a Kindle or another electronic book uh, machine, which is a reader, essentially, for books, where you can have a little machine with a screen and download the books right onto that screen and they're all stored in this piece of technology. It's just like a little computer. So why do you need books? Why do you need a physical place for a library? I would say I've looked at a number of recently built libraries and I live in the San Jose area and that has one of the most innovative libraries, uh, which is a joint library between the city of San Jose and San Jose State University. And everything in it is up to date. All the books are barcoded. It's got great you know, technology uh, there in the library. I think uh, we're in a period of experimenting with what the new library consists of. And I think there have been a number of creative experiments. It obviously does need to go beyond books. Now, the newer libraries have computer terminals, so it's a place where people can get internet access. They have DVDs that you can rent. They have listening stations for CDs and uh, you know, so they are incorporating modern technology. They, of course, use a database, computer database for the library catalog. Um, many libraries now, the Lafayette Library has the Learning Consortium. That's a unique feature of it. It's person-to-person it's -person learning, really, rather than just books. Uh, the San Jose Library has some very important special collections. It has a Beethoven Center with a lot of uh, original Beethoven manuscripts. It has the Steinbeck Center, 
which is uh, the repository of a lot of Steinbeck manuscripts and memorabilia. So my feeling is we're in a period of ferment and experimentation with what the new library is. And that in Lafayette, it already has a unique aspect by having the learning consortium associated with it. And I think it will find ways to serve the needs of people for information um, as it develops. So I'm confident that there is a place for the library. It's not the library of the past. There is a library of the future, which will do many things. It will house special collections, maybe on the history of Lafayette, which are not available on the internet. There will be objects, I'm sure, uh, that may be housed there. There is access to technology to find information that people uh, who perhaps don't have computers at home uh, will have access to. So it's definitely, uh, there's a new format for the library coming into being. And I think the Lafayette Library is actually one of the great creative leaders through the Glen Seaboard Learning Consortium in that reconceptualization of what the library is. is. You know, you're so supportive of libraries. I can't help but ask this following question. Were you the right person at the right time at the Commonwealth in the sense that all the stars aligned when the idea came up that you were the really right person to be there for us to be asking for you to participate as the Commonwealth in the in the learning consortium, and you know, in what ways were you that? Because it, you just there's so many things that are aligning that I'm wondering if a different person had been at the helm of the Commonwealth, would this have been the thing they would have jumped at? Well, first of all, let me say I've had a very small part in this project, very small. Truly, it has taken a village, and there have been so many people involved in this project. Um, I, the fact that I grew up in Lafayette and head the Commonwealth Club probably did create a very good connection in the sense that when Bob Fisher, and, and I ha you have to also say Bob Fisher is a terrific spark plug. He really makes things happen and he's somebody I could never say no to. And that's true of many other people too. So he got this in his, you know, grasped at the very beginning and really went around and contacted a lot of people and was very persuasive. So he's the person who came to me. So it was also that connection that made it possible. But yes, I was the right person at the right time at the Commonwealth Club, being from Lafayette and being, it was very easy for me to say, yes, of course, uh, we'll play a role in this. But um, I have to say, again, it's been a relatively small role compared to the people in Lafayette who've really grasped this and run with it and persuaded other people right. like me to get involved with it. Well, I did go to the San Francisco Library and did notice um, some time ago, I'm sure it's still true, uh, that you guys sometimes pair with them on some programs. I'm wondering, um, have you now, uh, is this something you've, you've now repeated with a third library out there? Is this something that's become a template? Well, we actually do hold, we have a, our second office is in San Jose, and a, about a quarter of our programming is in Silicon Valley. And uh, we do hold some of those programs in the mm -hmm. San Jose Public Library. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, and they have, in fact, I'm, we do a lot of community forums that we do in San Jose and Silicon Valley there. And so, yes, we have a partnership there. That's been going on for a few years. And um, in fact, we're just putting together another community forum on some economic development issues in San Jose uh, that will be held at the public library. So you're kind of a template for this nice pairing of a, a, a different organization, pairing with libraries to create these learning opportunities for communities. How much are you seeing this happen on a nationwide scale, or you approach because you're one of the first to do that? Where, where is that happening well, nationally with libraries? And by the way, I will also say that we have held um, events in the Reardon Library, which is in downtown San, uh, San, uh, Los Angeles. The Commonwealth Club occasionally does programs in other parts of the state, parts of the state, or parts of the country. And but that's also another redone renovated, reformulated public library that is doing new things. We, we've actually held panels there uh, with one of the public uh, television stations in Los Angeles. And they've got um, an auditorium there that has all the latest uh, video and audio technology in it and so on. So I would say that libraries have recently arisen as a place where uh, the Commonwealth Club and other organizations can be partners more easily. They have meeting rooms. 
They have, uh, you know, audiovisual technology that helps. They, a, a traditional library that had some stacks and some tables wouldn't really be a place that the Commonwealth Club could participate with because there'd be no place to have a community meeting. So I would say that it's been the recent resurgence and reformulation of libraries as having auditoriums and being community meeting places that has enabled us to partner with them. Robin, we've gone nearly an hour here. We have 13 minutes left. I'm not thinking about that. I'm not quite just going to ask you if you've got something left. But, okay, I wondered if we wanted to go to another tape or if we go well, to Mama, some I've been, summaries. I've been kind of... Uh, I was, in, yeah, I was just going to ask if you want. We, we were just, I was just, my last thing, and unless you think I haven't covered something, was just to ask you what else we haven't covered. Is there anything more? Do you know anything else we've covered in these things? That, this has been incredibly uh, interesting. This, this is, you know, great for the archives, like you say. What, what, what will be edited out uh, for some of these uses as the library opens may be very short. But at least we have this story well, what, uh, for future use. What are you finding that people have come and talked about that we're not covering here that you would really love to see talked about here this morning or this afternoon? Well, it's, you've done a wonderful job. What's so wonderful about you two is that so many people have their interviews and... Uh, uh, and, uh, we have experienced yeah. speakers here. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, are so professional with your background. But uh, I, I think I, I think I asked uh, mine. Is there anything that comes to mind? That Mama, any topic you'd like to bring up or address here? Well, I think I've expressed my uh, devotion to uh, libraries. It was an important part of my life. And you know my husband liked books, too. It's something we had in common. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of things that weren't in common. <laughs> but he really enjoyed reading. And we spent a lot of our time when we were early married and looking after our kids and taking our books to bed together and having an hour or two of reading. And uh, it was something we commented on. It was a, a thing between us. Mm -hmm. Not everybody likes to read, but I did, and he did, so that was a good thing. And you still read a lot, I notice, especially when we go to our home in the mountains. Mm -hmm. That seems to be the quiet time when you Oh, can. that's wonderful, because she does everything, <laughs> and I get to stay and read my book, <laughs> which I don't get to do around here as much. Mm -hmm. So, reading is a great joy, and... How are they, what are they going to do about people that have sight problems? They, they have two things already. They, are, they have um, the large print books that are available. They'll certainly be there. You can also download uh, books, and there's, there's tapes. There's a number of things that are, we've been very uh, curious about the library for people with sight problems in terms of DVDs and you know, books on tape. It's been a huge part. Joan Merriman and her husband started that before they passed away. And uh, so they're totally available at the library. And now through the internet, you can get a number of things as well and pull them right into your computer. Good. So, um, well, all right. I, I think Gloria, did you have any uh, philosophical, profound, <laughs> futuristic, uh, or anecdotal sort of uh, thoughts? Well, I just say that it's, I've been very impressed by the volunteers who have worked together on the library project, and also the city of Lafayette representatives. There has been a great team here in Lafayette. So as someone who grew up in Lafayette and then has left and lived in many other communities, I've been so pleased to see the collaboration and the hard work, the tenacity of the, the volunteers, Steve Falk, the city manager. It gets right down to They've gotten very involved as we've started the Commonwealth Club programs. Also, Steve Falk will pour the wine at the events. And you know anything that comes up, uh, we've had many meetings with the group in terms of strategy for the library. And, uh, they're thinking about everything right down to the, um, you know, the LCD screens that will be in the lo lobby of the library and what's going to be on the screens. It's just been a very loving and tenacious and insightful process by a group of volunteers in the city of Lafayette. So I just like to say my hat is off to this group of people. It's really wonderful to see people in a community come together and make a project like this work. 
And uh, you know, I still remember when we went up to Sacramento, uh, the pe people had a, a sash that we all wore, and we all put the sash on that said something about uh, the Lafayette Library Project so that we stood out among the crowd of all the people advocating for their different so communities and the bond, for the bond funds and so on. It has been fabulously organized. And the beautiful facility that will result is a testament to that group of people who have taken the project from beginning to end and done a terrific job. That is really a nice uh, statement. And Steve Falk, Falk went into uh, great detail about that uh, meeting, told the story so well. It was a cliffhanger. And everybody thought, uh, no, no chance, you know, for uh, all these reasons. And then it at the last minute it seemed to be pulled out of the, the hat and it was such a credit to you people that were there. I'm trying to remember what that sash said. I think I mentioned it in my column at one point, but they had something clever on and great big, I think, yellow sashes that everybody wore. Mm -hmm. This was when we went up to Sacramento when they were doling out money from the state budget for new library projects. Oh, and, and they were from Lafayette. Yeah, we got... 10 million, 11 million. 